Ja, hallo und guten Abend. Hello, ladies and gentlemen, to our fourth part, fourth volume of our series Transitional Justice, organized by the Federal Foundation for the Study of the Communist Dictatorship in Eastern Germany. And we are inviting you today. My name is Tamina Kutscher. I'm editor-in-chief of the platform decoder.org. We deal with Belarus and Russia, and I'm your facilitator tonight. And I'm facilitating all the volumes of this series, and we deal with international perspectives in terms in terms of how to deal with the past after war, violent dictatorships, etc. And we will also provide you with information, provide you with an oversight in terms of specific um, culture of memory and remembrance of specific countries. And we um, deal with, we've already dealt with the Visegrad countries and the Baltics. And now we go back to, or we've dealt with the topic of 1989. And most of the people do associate positive things with this year. And there has also been another aspect as the, the year 1989 has not been a positive year for all the countries in Eastern Europe, of course, and it hasn't been the year of a peaceful shift in terms of democracy, etc. But there have, because there have been violent problems, a violent war in other countries, and some of the countries like Albania um, started their, po well, went through other um, developments in the 1990s, for example. And when we think about the former Yugoslavia, 1991 up to 2001 um, was scattered and influenced by war. So what about the situation in the countries after war, after violent rule, after a double um, kind of dictatorship? And we want to deal with this topic tonight and we will go to um, Albania, Bosnia, Herzegovina, Yugoslavia, Croatia. Um, and yeah, to the different countries. So we talk about national identities and transnational relations in the Balkans. This is our topic of tonight. And I would like to wish a very warm welcome to four experts, ladies, four ladies tonight. We have a ladies' night. And this is, I think, a lovely um, aspect tonight. I would like to start with Yunila Gudule. I wish you a very warm welcome. It's nice to have you here in Tirana in Albania and you are the director of the Institute for Dem Democracy, Media and Culture in Albania and she was one of the first independent journalists after communism and you became famous due to your interviews with um, political actors and between um, 1997 and 2005, you have been um, in charge of Germany and you have been a correspondent for Germany for Albanian newspapers. So you know the two cultures and you teach journalism and political communication at the University of Tirana. And I think you will provide us with important information. And you're one of the outstanding personalities, outstanding figures in terms of transitional justice. Um, so you organize um, competitions for pupils and other things. So I'm very happy that you're here today and that you're with us. Wish you a very warm welcome. Lovely to have you. Thank you very much for the invitation. Now, I would like to proceed for Romania. We go to Montreal, we go to Canada, to Professor Lavinia Stan. It's lovely to have you here. You, are, you teach at the San Francis um, Xavier University in Canada, and you are the director of the Center for Post-Communist Studies. And you are an expert in terms of, in the field of comparative political sciences, and you focus your research on transitional justice in the post-communist Europe. And I think some of you might know her books and her publications, and you say it is all about 
and the new democracies and why some of them are ready to deal with um, what happened in the past, human rights violations and other crimes and others don't want to do that. So this is a huge question, of course, a very important one. And I think we will come back to this question later. But first of all, I wish you a very warm welcome. Lovely to have you. Now we go to Croatia, to Zagreb, to Vesna Tersilic. She is, hello, nice to have you here. So in 2004, you founded the organization Documenta Center for Dealing with the Past. And so dealing with the past, with the history of Croatia. And one of the objectives of this organization is to find out um, the facts and the truth um, on the war and to contribute, to create a dialogue and to facilitate a dialogue. And one of the main um, reason for the foundation of the organization was the falsification of war crimes and other war-related events that happened from 1941 up to 2000. So there's Natasha Selic. She's one of the co-founders in 1991 of the anti-war campaign. And in 1998, she received the alternative Nobel Prize for Peace and the Right Livelihood um, Award. And we're very happy that you're here today and that you will provide us with an insight in your impressive work in terms of your archive and all your um, scientific work. Now, last but not least, I would like to wish a very warm welcome to coming from the summer heat of Sarajevo, um, Davorka Tuk um, from Bosnia Herzegovina. She is an educationalist at this or teacher at the Center for Nonviolent Action in Sarajevo. It's so nice to have you here. So the center's mission is um, to create nonviolent action and to create sustainable peace in the region of the former Yugoslavia by promoting nonviolence and dialogue and to facilitate um, dealing with the past. And of course, there are challenges you are facing, and I think you will give us some information on your work. So thank you very much for coming. Thank you very much that you're here. Now, I would like to say that this is a virtual and online space of the Federal Foundation for the Study of the Communist Dictatorship in Eastern Germany. And we're very happy that you, ladies and gentlemen, that you participate in this event and you are most warmly invited to ask your questions. Um, you can use the chat or you can send an email. I will receive the questions and then I will um, forward them to our experts. This is of high importance for us to be able to ask questions and um, to, to join the discussion. So, Ms. Godole, in Vohocha, um, Albania had during the 46 years of um, its regime, it was kind of isolated. People have been monitored. There were forced labor camps, um, millions of people thousands of people vanished and they haven't been found today. And when he died, Ramis Aliyeh, um, and we're talking about 1991 and not 1989, um, there wasn't any walls coming down like in the, in the former GDR, but there have been the first, um, there was also a shift and um, there was, it also prepared the ground for new, um, democracies and um, this notion of reconciliation is always used for blood revenge and so dealing with um, reconciliation and guilt after the fall of the communism isn't um, existence or existent until today so this is quite um, yeah well this is a very sad result I would say but now I would like to come back to this so what what happened was that in 2010, there has been an institute founded in, for the research on war crimes, etc. In 2015, the archives of the communist secret police have been um, opened for the public. But why do you say this? Why are you so critical 
Why do you judge the situation as critically as you do? Yes, thank you very much for the for the nice introduction. How many minutes do I have? How much time do I have? You need to keep it short and sweet, please, because we don't have much time. And this is a very vast um, field of information. So regarding Albania, when I was in Germany and in other countries, I was in the Czech Republic and Poland and Eastern Europe, but only in Romania. But our communism, our dictatorship um, is not really known, well known in, in the West. People know something about the history in general, but you don't have official dates um, and facts regarding um, victims, for example. And you've already said about it, thousands, tens of thousands people vanished. And we, ha we talk about 5,000 or 6,000 people. We don't know the figures exactly. And this is quite much. These are many people for a small country like Albania used to be. And I think it just had around about 2 million um, inhabitants. So the dictatorship really um, create or made of the whole country a prison. I just want to wrap up or give you an overview or an Im image, an impression of Albania and um, the situation. And um, because we will also talk about the, the impact of it. So when did we start? When did this um, dealing with the past start? Well, when it started, at least. We don't know whether it really started or not. So um, the whole country was like a prison with many, many prisons, 48 labor camps. Um, thousands of people have been vanished. They have been in, um, in camps up to, with their families up to the third or fourth generation um, in the mid-40s up to the 1990s. And I think 35,000 um, politically or persecuted people were imprisoned. More than 1,000 of people died in the prison in prisons, and I think around about 5,000, 6,000 um, people have been executed or they vanished. We don't know where they are. And whole families vanished. And in the 1990s up to 2000 something, um, we haven't even found their bodies. Just, just a few bodies have been found. So um, in the 1967, in the year 1967, you know that there has been a um, the constitution um, banished or started a ban on, imposed a ban on religion and many problems were what started and many groups that have also um so for example touristic groups or study trips study groups um who came to that came to albania know about this history because they um received um insights why do i talk about religion because when we talk about reconciliation we also have to um refer to religion and this religious situation in albania of course because we talk about this notion um, of reconciliation and my generation um that has been socialized during the dictatorship um just we we didn't we didn't talk about religion or we haven't heard anything about religion at school of course because we um, were socialized during the the dictatorship and i think in this context this notion this idea of reconciliation like it is used in germany and other former um, communist countries after the war came down, after the fall of the um, Iron Curtain, it, it's not really the same, you know. So reconciliation in our context rather refers to blood revenge because we talk about families in North Albania and Kosovo because this um, notion, this term of um, blood revenge, so Petin, we, this is what we call, then we think about um, blood revenge, well, in the past, but um, we don't think about reconciliation. And of course, you said that since 2010, things changed at least. So 20 years after um, the end of the ending of the dictatorship, there was a beginning for dealing with the past. It was not really a beginning, it was rather a social um, shift or a, um, it started within society. So I think 
coming to terms with the past, dealing with the past started at the beginning of the 1990s, between 1992 and 1997, because many processes have been started with a first democratic government. There have been genocide tribunals and processes, so um, these kind of tribunals, but not more than 35 um, public figures have been, um, have been prosecuted. And But the problems are talking about in nomenclatura, but after the former communists came to power again, and these tribunals took place, nevertheless, these tribunals haven't really been um, finished or ended. There haven't been any indictments, so to speak. And um, in terms of this topic, I think there haven't been any illustrations, no, no justice for um, the victims of the past. Is that the reason why there's such a lack of reappraisal, that there was no change of elites? Yes, definitely. For me, this is even the strongest reason why this did not work. In 1991, we didn't start to reappraise our past. However, um, the convicted functionaries, um, between 1997 and 2005, for the former communists remained in power. And that was a slap into the face of all victims of the communist regime, of everybody who was prosecuted, persecuted for political reasons, imprisoned for political reasons. Because until today, they uh, have not received uh, the full financial compensation. The nomenclature, however, received a compensation. After we decided, I have to look up or what the court said. According to the court, they were not able to punish actions that at the time when they were committed were not illegal. So that was what the court said. And that was the beginning and the end of the reappraisal process in Albania in the sense of transitional justice. So in a sense uh, in which those who were really responsible were also made responsible and received punishment. I personally and, um, find, and many studies show, that this installed a culture of uh, impunity that remained uh, during the whole period of transition. A whole political elite can be corrupt, can commit crimes um, of any dimension, and nothing will happen. And that is what is going on until today. In all international reports, it says that Albania has a large corruption, but um, we have the same political class and the same political leaders. Uh, we have had them from 1991 until now. And for me, that was one of the most important moments. I understood that we were not able to deal with the past correctly and uh, in full scope. And for me, that um, means that this was a wrong approach, uh, a wrong start into democracy and a state under the rule of law. In 2010, the Institute for the Studies of Communist Crimes and Consequences was founded. It has a very small budget and very few people who uh, are meant to deal with the whole history of communism. For 10 years, they have been working now and they wrote more than 100 books, studies, autobiographies, and published them. And uh, they are permanently, in the past eight years, uh, the socialists, the former communists were in power and tried everything in order for this institute to be in the news. Uh, they changed the law. I am a member of the board of the, this institute. It's a public institute and the board is appointed by, by or elected by parliament. And the scope of uh, the studies is rather small. It was reduced one year ago. And now the work of the Communist Party before 19, 
45 um, is not um, examined, um, and everything that we are allowed to study ends in 1990. So what happened? Uh, what did the Communist Party do during the war? This is not studied. Um, any Stalinist methods that were used are not examined. So the institute exists, but it is very limited and it's not supported by the state. In Albania, everything is um, divided. Um, this institute was founded during the rule of the Democratic Party and it is uh, perceived as an institute of the Democratic Party. And as I've said, um, a reconciliation is not possible. It's always their history and our history, the communists and the anti-communists. And it's not a, f a fact that pertains only to Albania. I think this holds true also for other countries. So but there is no um, historical reappraisal. Society hasn't started any debate and has not decided what to do with this dictatorship. We had a dictatorship for 45 years. It was a criminal system and everybody should develop an opinion against this dictatorship. But we never had this as society. And it seems that this will remain like that. In 2015, something positive happened, but um, you said that an act or a law to open the Sigurimi records was adopted, but it was rather a law on information about these records. That was very interesting because this law uh, was developed according to the German model. It doesn't contain an illustration. Unfortunately, we have this German system because the government at that time was uh, happy with that. Uh, the Albanian dictatorship, however, has nothing to do with the German dictatorship, with what happened in Germany, in East Germany, the GDR. The Albanian dictatorship um, is something different. It um, should be examined uh, following the model of Romania or the Czech Republic uh, and illustration should definitely take place in order to hold people responsible. This is what this law should do. However, the law that we have doesn't have anything to do with illustration. It uh, studies uh, the institutions, but Mrs. Cordola, sorry for interrupting you. I think we've understood your point, and it was very impressive how you uh, described this culture of impunity uh, that uh, seems to uh, um, pass through uh, the past years. You mentioned um, that maybe this is similar in other societies, this culture of impunity. I think this is a very good buzzword because it also fits our next example, Romania. The statement that Slovenia Stan wrote us beforehand, and maybe here we can also uh, clarify the differences between your two countries. Um, that is why I would like to pass the floor uh, to our next speaker. We will definitely come back to Albania and to the role of the civil society and also um, We'll talk about remembrance in the families. We've received one question already, but let us now uh, pass uh, the floor to Romania. We talked about a culture of impunity. You um, explained us the situation in Albania. Mrs. Stan, you sent us the following statement on Romania. Romania has pursued moderate transitional justice and avoided more radical methods which were seen as being driven by revenge. However, it failed to achieve reconciliation or to avoid hate. The communist and fascist pasts have been only selectively redressed. Ethnic minorities have been generally overlooked or considered only at the pressure of foreign actors. And the reckoning process has been heavily politicized. The result is weak rule of law high corruption and impunity, chronic distrust in government and a divided society. This is done. This is what you wrote about Romania. Uh, and now that we've 
listened to Mrs. Godola, we could say that um, this is not only true for Romania, but of course it highlights uh, the specific situation. You write about a moderate transitional justice. What exactly was done in Romania or what was not done? And do you think when you uh, look at Romania, but also at Albania, do you think that the more radical methods are more effective methods? if uh, they are perceived as a revenge? Mm -hmm. um, well, I was, uh, I was uh, uh, listening to the uh, presentation on Albania and it struck me that uh, uh, there are so many common points with Romania that it's uh, incredible, you know, and in, it, indeed these are two countries um, that in many ways uh, have many commonalities. Romania, remember in 1989, uh, uh, immediately after the Romanian revolution, yeah, had three recent pasts to reckon with. It was the, uh, the Nazi past, um, uh, the, the communist past, decades long, and the Romanian revolution, which was the only uh, bloody revolution in uh, Eastern uh, Europe, you know. And uh, what strike, uh, uh, strikes me whenever I look at Romania is that of the three main goals of transitional justice, truth, justice, and reconciliation, they were they were taken by various political actors and interpreted uh, according to their own needs. For example, uh, in Romania, power after the revolution, uh, uh, the successors of the communists were also communists, the second echelon uh, uh, of the communist party. Yeah? So the, um, the new social democrats in Romania, uh, the, the new revolutionaries, uh, explained that um, reconciliation was the main a goal of reckoning, of reassessing the recent past, unless we want, um, you know, um, um, sham uh, trials like Nicolae Ceausescu's trial uh, to be perpetuated and to be, you know, um, uh, to target other uh, Communist Party officials. So whereas the, the, the new, the successors to the Communist Party um, uh, proposed that uh, reconciliation was the main uh, goal of reckoning, the anti-communists said, just a second, we cannot reconcile unless we know what the heck happened in, uh, uh, in, uh, in communist times, uh, during Nazi times, during the revolution. How many people died? How many people were uh, deported, were imprisoned, were uh, disappeared, etc., etc.? So this need for truth, for uh, making uh, former perpetrators and torturers uh, responsible uh, for their crimes was um, uh, proposed mainly by the anti-communist opposition at the time, yeah, uh, during the early 1990s. So you have actually uh, both, both the successors to the Communist Party and the uh, and their um, op political opponents um, arguing for transitional justice, but understanding very different ways, yeah, very different content in this transitional justice box, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, the reluctance of the of the former communists of the new. Uh, newly rebaptized social democrats, and uh, especially Ion Iliescu, who was the first uh, post communist president and uh, uh, who was a high ranking uh, um, member of the Communist Party, to, to, to reckon with the, with the um, um, legacies of the human rights violations perpetrated by during the revolution, during the communist times, during the Nazi times. Uh, meant that impunity uh, uh, remained uh, there, unsolved, unaddressed. A rule of law, um, which uh, in Romania uh, is, is a problem, remained very weak. Laws were passed, cases in courts were uh, discussed, depending on whoever was in power. So this is why 30 plus years after the collapse of the communist regime in Romania, so during 30 years when the 
Romanian society and especially the Romanian successive governments could have addressed and redressed the legacy of these three recent pasts. This is why yeah, we have a country where the, the governments are very self-interested, where rule of law is, um, is disregarded, was, where impunity is still there, and uh, mostly symbolic uh, measures of transitional justice have been adopted. Because you asked me, what did Romania do? Romania, it's, it's an interesting case because it's one of the fuzzy cases, you know? It's not a country where nothing happened or very little happened as in Albania, you know? And it's not a country where a lot happened, you know, like in Germany. It's depending on what you see, you can say, well, it did quite a decent job or it did nothing, you know? And it's... Here we kind of stumble on what kind of definition of transitional justice uh, do you use? You know, uh, if you are Ruti Title and uh, one of the legal scholars, you say, well, I'm looking at courts and what the courts can do, meaning uh, um, cases against uh, uh, against um, uh, torture, against victimizers. Um, compensation packages uh, handed out by the state, uh, also through the courts, uh, restitution of property also decided by the courts. Um, you know, even in Romania, lustration uh, was decided and lustration verdicts were uh, ultimately decided by the courts, you know. Uh, but Aber that's... what would you say, Jostan? They beschäftigen sich ja mit so vielen... So what is your learning? Because you deal with so many different countries in terms of transitional justice in different countries. So what do you think? What about this package of transitional justice, this box? What about the... What does it need to contain to include in order to really start reappraising or dealing with the past? I would say that when we look at the recent past, one major question we have to ask ourselves is, is the state, meaning the government, the successive governments, yeah, are they willing to do something? And they can do a lot, you know? They can do trials, they can do lustration, they can do so admin administrative punishment, they can... Uh, open uh, secret archives. They can uh, rewrite history textbooks and present a new, you know, uh, version of history to, uh, to the uh, kids in schools. They can offer compensation. They can offer rehabilitation and pardons of former, um, of former uh, victims. They can do a lot of things. But what do you do when the state is reluctant to do to engage in all these methods then civil society and we have all these representatives of civil society groups here mm -hmm. can take can preempt the reluctance of the state they can take upon their shoulders to to do stuff ultimately it is the state that wronged the citizen and to a certain extent the state has to say i'm sorry i did wrong you know, it is so, only so much that the uh, civil society can can um, um, uh, put itself in the shoes of the state when you have a state that is really re reluctant. And we look at Russia, you know, I mean, Memorial Society has done impressive work, but ultimately it is, you know, it, it is only so much that society, uh, civil society can do uh, when you have a, a state that is very reluctant and the, and the Russian state, you know, uh, created the commission to, uh, against falsification of history, uh, you know, and uh, hunted down all the historians, for example, who were saying that Stalin is a murderer. Stalin is the brain behind all these all these. Um, human rights, gross human rights violations, you know. So I would say what what the uh, experience of Eastern Europe, of, of the former communist countries teaches us is that there is a lot of methods, judicial and non-judicial, um, financially connected or symbolic, even knocking down uh, statues, uh, changing the names of streets, you know, mm -hmm. from mm -hmm. Stalin to something else. So there is a lot of space 
for governments that are willing to do something, yeah, to teach something else to their uh, to their population. Um, but also, when when the governments are reluctant, you have the civil society engaged in this process. You know, so from this point of view, if we look at all this multitude of judicial and non-judicial uh, methods, I would say that we can we can rank Eastern European former communist countries from the uh, the most uh, willing to redress the past, the recent past to the least willing, you know? And here I would say, by and large, of course, yeah, by and large, Central European countries, Germany, Poland, Hungary, have done quite a lot, you know? Um, the Baltic states also have done quite a lot when it comes to, of course, we, it's, it's not as much as we would want to be, you know? Then you have the middle of the pack, uh, you know, it's like Romania, uh, sometimes Hungary, would, uh, would, uh, Bulgaria, you know, are somewhere there, Moldova, you know. And then you have countries that are really reluctant, like Russia, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so there is a hierarchy, a, a ranking that you can come up with. But it also depends very much on the definition of transition justice you use. Yeah, this is an appeal. Yes, thank you very much. I think this was a call, a plea for um, the single governments to, to show willingness and also to the um, civil society to assume um, responsibility. But there is a, a huge need of political willingness or willingness, of course, and we need facts and facts can be manipulated and facts can also be used politically and falsified or misused. And um, this is the perfect bridge I, we can build to um, Vesna Tertilic and your center for uh, center documenta, because this is what you do. It's about facts, about um, collecting facts and information on the wall and what happened and the wrong that was um, did in the past, starting in 1941. And you, um, in your statement, you said, that every day we deal with um, with hatred and we hope or we have high hopes for reconciliation and commemorating the war victims from 1990 and 1991 is um, there's a problem of um, at the um, that the peace process, that there is a huge problem and reconciliation is a big problem. And this is what we've just heard, that um, courts and, the, and governments do not accept um, sentences and convictions and that they distort them. So, Ms. Tertulik, do you think that this is a pressing um, topic um, when it comes to Croatia? What are the possibilities you see um, for civil society in order to correct, in order to become active in this process? Uh, this is a very difficult burden for civil society. If you consider uh, civil society as a main actor, uh, that uh, has a very severe limitations because when looking at humanizing a relationship uh, to uh, victims, especially the killed and forcibly disappeared ones, if there is uh, limited political will, uh, of course the civil society organizations uh, can do something and Documenta uh, does something related to three different periods a violent past, first being from 41 to 45 uh, uh, during Second World War, when Holocaust against Jews, genocide of Serbs and genocide of Roma, and mass uh, killings uh, of Croats and other anti-fascists have been committed. Second being uh, the mass revenge during uh, the first uh, weeks uh, from May 15, uh, 1945, uh, and period of political violence during Yugoslav socialism, being the most violent on the beginning uh, in uh, 45, 
uh, and gradually becoming uh, more socialistic, let's put it like that, uh, until uh, 1991. And the final third period, uh, wars uh, between 1991, starting with Slovenia and Croatia, and going on uh, through war in Bosnia and Herzegovina in 92, ending with uh, first Kosovo and then Macedonia in 2001. So it's that uh, as human rights organization, yes, we document the fate of killed and forcibly disappeared. Uh, we're most focused on period of 91 to 95 in Croatia because this is closest and it's, uh, it's possible for us to reach out to witnesses we have interviewed more than 7,000 witnesses and survivors and have currently documented uh, 20,197 victims in that war. But in Second World War, you had more than 10 times more victims and the numbers are uh, still disputed. So I have to say that uh, it's not just uh, politi politicians and civil society, but also academia uh, who have not uh, made what I would expect them to do, neither in uh, aftermath of Second World War, nor since 91, when we expected that we'll be moving uh, from less to more democracy, that being the most important transition, because you really want to have more democracy. And I would say that uh, most of uh, citizens of Croatia wanted to have more democracy. But what happened then with justice, what happened with reparation, what happened with uh, restitution, uh, it's, it's a very... Uh, weird process with many ups and downs. And it is that uh, Croatia, as one of uh, post yugoslav republics, being in peculiar position, uh, in which uh, eventually, uh, concerning Second World War, Yugoslavia ended uh, war in the club of winners between the light forces, uh, having to face uh, eventually dealing with Nazi crimes, with fascist, when I say fascist, I mean Italian fascists, and then um, Nazi and fascist collaborators, Ustasha, Chetniks, Weigard. I mean, uh, the story of uh, Ustasha concentration camps, which in a period from 91 uh, to now, in that 30 years, got somehow completely... Um, manipulated. So it's that uh, we came from the story of partisans as, as winners in the middle of interpretation to story of uh, Ustashi soldiers as the ones uh, most commemorated and uh, that, that being uh, one surprise, but the other being that uh, neither we have benefited very much uh, with new research related uh, to the crimes during Second World War, nor we benefited very much related to scientific research uh, on uh, mass killings of uh, Nazi and fascist collaborators. So the numbers are still very disputed, uh, somewhere between 40,000 and 80,000 killed. Uh, and it's that uh, we are still a society uh, which discusses a lot, we struggle a lot, memory struggles are loud, ongoing, and not very productive. So it's that uh, when uh, finally uh, we got to the point that we voted uh, in 90 uh, in referendum uh, regarding uh, the status of Croatia and uh, Croatia uh, same day as Slovenia uh, on uh, June 25th, 1991, declared uh, independence. Uh, we have not found out much more about our history. Interpretations kept changing. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, what was decided politically, for example, that uh, concerning injustices related to the property which have been uh, taken um, 
or nationalized uh, in 1945, I was always puzzled why the nationalization of property law have eventually taken in account what Communist Party did. So the year which was relevant for uh, returning property was 1945, while large part of Jewish Serbian property had been taken from people in 1941, and this was not <laughs> uh, restituted. And there are still processes uh, and uh, Jewish claims conference is still involved in negotiations without much success concerning Jewish property. And there are still ongoing ne negotiations with uh, Serb and Orthodox uh, institutions. So it's uh, that there are so many open questions. And uh, I would say that, okay, documented documents human losses. We, we document fate of killed and missing. We have recorded more than 500 personal memo memories covering uh, um, actually whole 20th century, uh, our oldest interlocutor uh, having been born uh, in 1917. Uh, but as this is something what is done by civil society organization, and we, we try to portray it through data on killed and forcibly disappeared, and with personal memories, and with... Uh, pointing our finger to uh, the places uh, of suffering which have been forgotten. Uh, for example, in two days on June 24th, will be 80 years since uh, bringing first prisoners to Slana concentration camp. We needed 80 years to have first exhibitions on this Slana concentration ca uh, camp in which Ustashe and regime of so-called independent Croatia have killed thousands of Serbs and Jews. And this is completely, you know, complete oblivion. Yes, any of us you at least have heard sometimes about. Very few people ever heard for that concentration camp. So it's that uh, when you have limited political will, then it's very difficult to move towards uh, a situation in which uh, eventually uh, suffering is recognized, disregarding ethnic uh, or uh, national or religious identity of the victims. Mm -hmm. We're still far from that. And I have to say that for uh, the 90s, for war of independence between 91 and 95, there have been a lot of judicial processes. Uh, Eventually, I have to mention International Criminal Tribunal for War Crimes in ex-Yugoslavia, which have indicted 161 persons and have uh, brought uh, them to face of justice. Some have been acquitted, some have been sentenced, uh, some uh, uh, final uh, sentences have been just pronounced recently uh, against Ratko Mladic and he got life. Uh, and with so many uh, uh, verdicts, uh, for uh, genocide in Srebrenica. And two main uh, persons, uh, Karadzic and Mladic, giving orders, with so many facts which have been established beyond uh, reasonable doubt in a court of law, which makes this period of violence very different from uh, Second World War uh, violence and uh, post-war revenge and political violence and socialism, because you have some verdicts, but very few. But these have not helped, socially speaking, in a sense of uh, social acceptance of judicially established facts. I would say that as time is passing, the judicially established facts are getting even further and more disputed. And I'm sure that maybe Davorka will say something about that also, and I need to uh, to leave her some space to be able to say that. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Vesna. Danke schön. Um, yeah. Thank you very much, Vesna. Um, in fact, um, we, you already passed the floor to Davoka. Davoka, your statement sounds a little bit like the solution for all those conflicts that Uh, we have been talking about, about these different narratives um, and the conflict lines that uh, remain with us. 
Um, you write in your statement, when suffering is not relativized, when there is a place uh, for remembering the injustices against all people, as well as for remembering acts of resistance to violence and war, there will also be foundations for mutual understanding, empathy and solidarity. Of course, this is a wonderful, an ideal goal that you are writing about. How far has uh, Bosnia-Herzegovina come in this process, or the Balkans in general? How close are you to this goal? Well, um, not in general, uh, but there are some NGO initiatives which are on this course, as well as uh, uh, there is also a few shifts noticeable uh, on a municipality level. Um, for, um, as you uh, mentioned in your uh, introduction, um, my organization is a peace organization and uh, we, uh, what we are trying to do is uh, build trust again uh, between people uh, of, uh, uh, in the region of former Yugoslavia and uh, uh, somehow try to uh, get closer to each other. And one of the ways that we are doing that is that we are for quite some time organizing the visits to marked and unmarked uh, places of uh, suffering as well as official commemorations and uh, also official memorials. And, uh, uh, and we are doing that with the uh, mixed group of war veterans from all former warring sites. And uh, our primary intention uh, is really to pay respect to all the victims, uh, regardless of their origin. But we are also trying to set some kind of an example. Uh, you know, when uh, former soldiers of an army uh, uh, that, did, that committed the crime, uh, come to pay their respects to the victims and their families to acknowledge the suffering uh, uh, of the name community, uh, something transformative happens instantly uh, because official commemorations um, in the region are usually, uh, they often serve as a platform for nation building. So you can expect at a certain point uh, for hate speech to appear, uh, to, to say the least. Uh, uh, but when a group of others, of enemies, are present and uh, uh, they come to pay the respect to the victims, then hate speech subsides immediately. You know, people open to our group and this becomes a, a, a true place of remembrance. And this is what we are trying to, to set an example for, for political and religious leaders, but also for, for, for the ordinary people. And there are some political leaders, on, uh, mainly on municipality level, uh, who are uh, making these uh, 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 steps over the boundaries, uh, 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 so to say. So like in Varish, uh, uh, where you have a municipality chief who is a Croat, who supports and, and uh, 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 attends commemoration for the Bosniak victims uh, of his community, as well as the munip municipality uh, chief in Rudo, which is in the Republic of Srpska, who also attends and supports the commemoration for the uh, uh, Bosniak victims of his community. So uh, also now uh, in, in recent days, what, we, uh, uh, what was in, in the media is that new Sarajevo mayor, upon the, the years-long uh, initiative uh, of the local NGOs is planning a memorial for the uh, uh, Serb civilians killed during the siege of Sarajevo by the Bosniak forces. And also there are some steps forward for, for uh, uh, installing the memorial for the killed children of Predor. As you may know, Predor is one of six municipalities uh, uh, that were uh, named in the indictment uh, against uh, Radko Mladic, although only Srebrenica was adjudicated as, as, as a genocide. So there are still mm. some steps forward, but those are um, uh, uh, seldom examples. What, what we are fighting with is that uh, main challenges that uh, uh, for this process come mainly from entity and state political level, 
um, because you know uh, in in Bosnia and Herzegovina, our political leaders are mostly, oh, well, <clears throat> I have to be honest, they are basically a warmongers, you know. So uh, since this is the only way for them to to remain power, remain in power, to install fear of and hatred towards the others. Uh, you know, and this is something they do on a daily basis. So the uh, also the educational system supports the segregation. History curricula often serves as a platform for uh, strengthening of specific narratives. This is further supported to the mainstream media. So uh, you really have to work hard and fight hard against this tendencies, but you know, on a, uh, uh, on a basic grassroots level, it really does function. And it's not uh, uh, until now, I don't know, we attended more than, I, I would dare to say more than 50 official commemorations uh, uh, for the victims on all sides. And uh, uh, I can say that only once or twice, uh, uh, we were not welcomed there you know so it, it it really means a lot for the people especially for the victim families uh to to uh, uh, uh acknowledge their pain and to acknowledge their 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 suffering and this is something that is not done in a sufficient manner uh, uh, uh on a, on on this mainstream political level, but it is very possible to do it uh, uh, when you are working uh, uh, in a field with, with, with people, you know, because um, uh, what we are trying, what we need to do is somehow find ways to over, uh, overcome collectivization of guilt, as well as victimization, which is a wide, widespread self-perception, not only in, in Bosnia and Herzegovina, but also uh, in the, uh, all of the countries of, of Western uh, Balkans, uh, there is a huge tendency to label the whole groups or nations uh, as either victims or, or either perpetrators of violence. And we need somehow to, to uh, 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 still we are working basically on a conflict transformation and uh, uh, trying to change the dominant enmity and change the, the hostility fueling narratives and towards some kind of multi-perspective way. And to do that, we need to deconstruct uh, the enemy images. And this is possible through, for example, dialogue uh, uh, sessions. They can be very helpful in understanding currently held images and identities and um, how can they be, how, how can they be shifted. But uh, I think that even more important is to uh, treat the, uh, all the loss of human life equally, independent of the, the, the uh, victim's origin or, or circumstances. And that, that will prevent victimhood of collective and uh, prevent the creation of narratives uh, of good and evil collectives and also prevent the collectivization of, of, of guilt. Um, but I, I would like to somehow extend to uh, what my predecessors were saying uh, uh, about reconciliation. You know, you know um, basically, uh, um, you don't need justice, truth, revenge, punishment, or repair to, to stop hating others collectively. And this is what the, the reconciliation is all about, because hating the whole groups uh, of others, of the ones that we perceive enemies uh, uh, is what justifies the violence against them, and this is what uh, what makes the the the, the wars uh, possible. And the, the st uh, getting out of that circle of violence and staying out of that circle of violence is the only way. Uh, 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 only way, the only um, safeguard uh, mm. uh, of of non-violence. Wenn Sie das so sagen, würden Sie sagen, dass es diese Would you say that uh, prosecution of perpetrators is not necessary? Do I get you right that uh, no. this even leads to people perceiving themselves even more as victims? No, uh, it is necessary. Of course, the prosecution is uh, very necessary. Not only the pr prosecution 
uh, of perpetrators, uh, but also we need to vindicate victims and we, we need to establish the forensic, tr forensic truth. And this is also uh, a huge support for the rule of law and uh, for respect of human rights. But uh, what we are experiencing in the aftermath, uh, aftermath of the persecutions uh, at the ICTY and at the domestic courts that, um, you know, uh, uh, they also produced further divides, in, especially in Bosnia and Herzegovina uh, society, because who to prosecute and for what uh, became basically a political question since there are co uh, competing narratives about how the atrocities began and why they began. So uh, prosecutions have left some Bosnians, uh, uh, Serbs especially, but also Croats, feeling that their uh, ethnic group has been treated unfairly or mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. crimes committed against their ethnic group did not receive an equal justice. Uh, and also, on the other hand, the predominant feeling among the, the Bosnian uh, Bosniak population is that uh, uh, the punishment uh, for the crimes was not long enough and that, uh, you know, the, 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 to in relation to the... Uh, 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 atrocities that 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 happened and of course not anyone who participated in the war will be prosecuted so we need to uh, uh, search for 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 also for uh, social means of of reconciliation uh, uh, let me put it like that because you know um, Mm. Uh, 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 all of this enforces this uh, uh, terrible feelings of, of, of resentment, uh, of guilt, of shame, and that uh, also uh, uh, enables uh, different political nationalistic uh, uh, actors to really uh, dispute already established facts about what happened. And... Uh, mm. um, the, the criminal justice cannot be really uh, the only way, although it was a predominant mechanism uh, in dealing with uh, uh, dealing with past atrocities during the 1992-1995 war. Mm. Um, and and I, I would also that? dare to what say that, that dealing with the past is not just a legal question, it is also a, a philosophical one even. Mm. So we have to address it on... Uh, lots of different 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 levels and and layers but uh, uh, what is uh, I think the, the most important part of this process is the the acknowledgement acknowledgement of the suffering that was experienced and uh, 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 this has to be done publicly in a way that that uh, will echo this pain you know and somehow uh, um, bring us more close to each other and, and uh, 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 get, getting us closer to, to, to understanding each other. Understanding doesn't mean justification. This is also very, very important. Mm. But uh, uh, when you understand uh, why something happened, then you, uh, then you can do something with it. You know, you can prevent it for, for, uh, from happening again, if, if not anything else. Also Sie appellieren auch an die Empathie. An das, an das so you call on empathy and mutual understanding. And this leads me to um, our questions from the public. And I would like to um, read some of those questions because some of our viewers would like to um, yeah, say something. So it is about the experiences and to publish the experiences and to provide some kind of a level of um, social empathy. And we received one question to Ms. Godole from the public. So first of all, thank you very much for um, what you've said. And is, do you think that the younger generation is interested in the violent and dictatorship past of um, HOT? So what do you think? Um, do the families talk about it? So is this um, the suffering, the sufferings is, the suffering, is it, um, do people talk about it? Yes, thank you very much for this question. I think the last weekend we um, talked about it because there have been 
people who want to um, participate in the study tour in Albania, so going to memorial sites and during the pandemic, it was impossible, of course, to join and um, to bring together different pupils, pupils and students. But if they come, when they go to these um, sites of suffering, former um, prisons and camps, etc., and when they hear the stories of the politically persecuted people and um, when they when they hear them they take them home and then they have two three days time to exchange and to exchange their opinions on this topic and we see that the young people do not didn't haven't received any information before because when they receive the information then they are interested in this topic but um what about the families do you think that within the families it's a taboo in 2016, I had the idea of starting a competition, asking your grandparents, that was the name, asking your grandparents about what happened. And um, the I was referring to the anti-communist, um, not only to the anti-communist um, grandparents, but also to the communist um, grandparents, of course. I'm talking about Stalin, etc. And we've received hundreds of of ideas and um, of videos, of, of ideas, of pictures, of images of the society, what people think about um, the past. And we've initiated a dialogue between the different generations. And this is important, that there is an intra-generational um, dialogue taking place no matter how and where, it is important that it takes place. And sometimes they are nostalgic grandparents. And this is also important for the process. And I think the young people, they need information and they need facts. They need um, information on what really happened. And um, of course, they have to deal with their grandparents and with their past. And this is a good idea. This is a good thing. But... Um, there has been, I think, in the families in Albania, people do not really talk about the dictatorships um, and the different curricula of the family members. But what is what is really disturbing me is that um, there are also texts written on the dictatorship, but only maximum four um, pages from grade one to grade four. And it's always about restitutions. It's not about the restitutions of... Um, of the dictatorships. No, it's about the restitution of the communist um, governments. But there isn't any word written on the victims, of the number of the victims, of what happened during um, the war. And we need all the different material, we need everything, all the information to provide the pupils, the students with those information to make them feel, to make them know what happened. We need um, a huge spectrum. We need, um, we don't want to be a drop in the ocean. This is not enough. Yes, I think you um, refer to a very important topic to the reappraisal or coming to terms or dealing with the past at schools. And we have a question to Devarka talk. And one spectator um, said that, thank you very much. It's a very important work you do. Thank you very much for that. And my question is, what about the younger generation? How do they deal with um, the violent past? Is this a topic at schools or in schools? And what do children know about th those topics or this topic? Um, what about, um, for example, children in families of former war, uh, of, of people who have been involved in the war? What about workshops? Well, thank you for this question. And this is a very important question because for the young people in Bosnia and Herzegovina, the consequences of the war is something they, they were born into and they feel it uh, as normal. You know, so it is uh, very common for uh, young people uh, of uh, different ethnic or religious background um, almost never to meet each other. And this is also supported by not only by politics, by, by, but also uh, uh, by the by the uh, educational system. And um, you know, the, the young ones are really uh, <clears throat> exposed to to these um, dominant nationalistic narratives in different ways. Not not only through media, also through 
their families, you know, and also uh, with talking with the friend, uh, with the friends, the war is a constant subject, but it, it is not speaking, uh, uh, it is not a, a constructive way that uh, uh, we talk about the war these days. And I will use the, the example how the, the state is uh, trying to uh, uh, further development, uh, develop these divisions uh, 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 on, a, on, a, on an example of history curriculum. For, for 30 years in Bosnia and Herzegovina, they, uh, there was a veto on um, uh, teaching the subject of 1992-1995 uh, uh, war. And after 30 years, that veto was uh, uh, lifted, and now the children are learning uh, uh, about the, the 90s, but they are learning a specific narrative depending on uh, where they reside. So children in Federation will learn about, uh, you know, the siege of Sarajevo, about the, the uh, violation and gross violations of, of uh, human rights during the war, uh, about the Srebrenica genocide. And uh, at the same time, the, the, the pupils in Republika Srpska will learn about the establish, uh, about the dissolution of Yugoslavia, about the uh, establishment of uh, Republika Srpska, and uh, about the Dayton Agreement. So th these are very two different different sides of, of, of the story, and we need somehow find a way to bring them together. And uh, this is not being done. And it, it is also very openly proclaimed that we want our children to learn our truth, you know. So, uh, but uh, uh, what would be some way forward is really to 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 open some kind of multi-perspective uh, view of the uh, of the war. And uh, what Vesna was saying about. Uh, uh, um, uh, uh, research about uh, uh, not only about the Second World War and uh, 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 period right after the war, but also the 1992-1995 is uh, very under-researched by local researchers. So there, there are only a few doctoral theses about it. And uh, uh, it, it it's really is a playground for, for, for nationalistic policies. And uh, we really need to, to ask ourselves, is this the way forward, you know? Do we want children to, to, to just, uh, uh, you know, be a parrot for, for nationalistic narrative, or do, do we want, uh, 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 you know, um, citizens and, and who will ask difficult questions and who will search for, for the answers? And this is also a huge task uh, uh, not only for civil society, which predominantly deals with it now, mm -hmm. but also for the uh, academic uh, uh, society. You know, there's a huge responsibility on their part. And uh, uh, do we want, you know, uh, um, these pillars uh, of narrative to 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 became a history because there there is there, there, there is so much difference between them you know because in uh, uh, what in 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 uh, uh, let's say Bosnian narrative of war uh, uh, would be called an aggression it it is a huge taboo in Republika Srpska and civil war which is a dominant narrative in Republika Srpska is a huge taboo in 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 federation and the the truth is uh, uh, somewhere in the middle you know it's not yeah. it's not that it's not that it's not that uh, 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 simple and so we are asking constantly for a more active participation of various institutions and uh, mm. individuals who would um, uh, have to use their their standing as experts and their academic integrity to influence uh, the authorities. Davorka, this this appeal. So Davorka, this um, plea for a multi-perspective point of view in terms of history as a task for civil society, academia, researchers, etc. We've um, received it. It's our um, take-home message. And I would like um, to hand over to Vesna talking about Croatia. What about the um, dealing with the past, coming to terms with the past in the younger generations at schools? What do they um, do? They receive information on the war or in terms of the fascist past? And another question coming from one of our viewers. 
but maybe you can respond it um, short and sweet because Davoka just talked about reappraisal and that it should not only be a, um, let's say, legal or judicial question, but that is rather a um, question of philosophy. And what about the international criminal law? Do you think this is a better method um, in order to pursue, in order to prosecute criminal wars or human rights violations compared to national um, war crime to national um, tribunals. What do you think? And um, what is the better um, the better variant or the better method? But maybe we can come back to the reappraisal to coming to terms or dealing with the past at schools. Thank you for questions. Uh, it is that uh, in schools, uh, there is some gradual improvement currently new history books uh, are uh, eventually sent to the schools and autumn will be time for analyzing them comparing them uh, and uh, look at what will happen in elementary and high schools uh, but uh, it is it is a challenge because uh, I would say that for post-communist societies, uh, quite often, uh, multi-perspectivity is not something really welcomed or not yet welcomed. It's that uh, we came from a situation uh, where uh, one truth, one narration, one dominant story uh, was imposed uh, more or less uh, forcefully um, until uh, 1989 or 1990. Uh, and uh, the multi-perspectivity approach is not taking roots so easily. And in Croatia, uh, additional challenge being that we actually do not have on national level obligatory civic education. So it's not just you know, it's not just a question of uh, teaching and learning history. It's also about Croatian language and uh, that few towns, uh, civic education uh, is eventually taught in Rijeka, Istria and some other places. Uh, Zagreb is expected to, to join this train uh, in, uh, 19, in 2022 only. So is that uh, there is far... Uh, uh, from sufficient time devoted to uh, either history teaching or finding out uh, about Second World War through experiences or uh, literature on Croatian uh, uh, teaching or uh, religious uh, education. So it's that uh, I would say that there are quite some informal history education programs which have been introduced uh, in last 10 years. So situation is getting gradually a bit better, but this is not a story of never ending progress. There are many reasons uh, for concern, uh, especially because uh, uh, younger generations are less and less patient and the didactic tools which need to be produced need to be more and more creative, shorter, uh, and it's difficult to present multi-layer history of 20th century uh, in one minute uh, video messages uh, or through, you know, exciting didactic games because you cannot pack everything in this kind of either comics or uh, video content. And the challenge remains and uh, the research uh, and we lack longitudinal research uh, on annual basis regarding uh, public opinion on most important historic topics. But whenever, every few years, once in a while, there is a research on attitudes of younger generation, uh, the results are getting worse and worse. They know less and less about uh, uh, Second World War past, about who were uh, the most prominent uh, Nazi or fascist or uh, Ustasha perpetrators. So there are all reasons for concern. And for your second question, international versus uh, domestic justice, I would say that when possible, both should be very welcomed. 
So it's that post-Yugoslav countries have been more than privileged to have uh, advantage of uh, war crimes prosecution at a tribunal. Uh, not many countries in the world have that. But we also learned a lesson that you might have international justice and domestic prosecution, and it's still not sufficient. You need much more. I would say that as humankind, we are still learning about dealing with the past social processes and transitional justice, and are still discovering uh, what we need to eventually come one step closer to acknowledging suffering of all the victims and survivors. Thank you very much, Vesna. I would like to ask one last question, and I would pass it to Lavinia Stan. Romania uh, brutally dealt with its dissidents. Uh, they were forcibly put into uh, uh, psychological hospitals. Are they today part of uh, society? Do they take part in the reappraisal of the past? Uh, some of them, uh, not all of them, because uh, many were driven into exile and um, um, they, they never returned to Romania. But uh, yes, there are, um, there are um, associations uh, of uh, former political prisoners. Um, but, you know, in terms of, uh, it, it's very important in Romania when you look at uh, the communist past, which exactly period you look, because there was a difference between the Stalinist uh, uh, communism and Nicolae Ceausescu's communism. Yeah, And I think the question refers more to Nicolae Ceausescu's um, habit of uh, no longer throwing dissidents in jail or uh, uh, and instead uh, forcing them into exile or uh, throwing them into the psychiatric world. Yeah? And um, there, are, there is still a lot of work to be done. Uh, a lot, uh, very instrumental in this regard was a former political uh, prisoner, uh, Constantin Ticu Dumitrescu, who became a senator. And actually he's uh, seen as the father of the um, uh, law that uh, allowed uh, ordinary Romanians to gain, gain access to their secret um, files compiled on them by the Securitate. So uh, they are organized, but at the same time, um, dissidence under, under, under Ceausescu was a rare thing, yeah? Uh, there are very few of them. They are isolated. They were isolated uh, one from the other. So um, um, although they each, uh, um, Adrian Ursu, for example, or we have, we have some shining cases, you know, there is no um, um, bang to the buck, you know, or uh, there is not such, such a serious impact that these former uh, dissidents are doing, are making. Mm -hmm. Yeah, vielen Dank. Lavinia Stan. Uh, Thank you very much, Lavinia Stan, also for this insight. Let me um, thank you all. Uh, it was a very interesting event, not only for me, I think also for our audience um, in uh, Germany. Mrs. Godola said at the beginning that unfortunately we hear far too little from the countries that we talked about tonight in Germany and in the German-speaking countries. It was really very interesting to listen to your insight, to your thoughts on transitional justice, not only uh, in terms of politics, but also in terms of uh, even philosophy and uh, this very humane approach. Thank you very much for being with us tonight. Thank you very much for sharing you. your experience and your thoughts with us. I would also like to um, thank our interpreters uh, of Echo Conference, Dolmetschen. Thank you for making um, understandable and audible what our participants said. So it was. Uh, possible for us to understand each other. And I would like to invite you to come back uh, after the summer break and to uh, listen to our next event on the 14th of September. 
Then we will talk about the topic between liberation and influence dealing with the Soviet occupation in contemporary Caucasus. So as you see, we are looking at very many different perspectives. Thank you very much for being with us tonight. I wish you a great evening. Thank you for being with us and um, have a